Gangland widow Judy Moran is tonight contemplating spending the rest of her life in prison after a jury found her guilty of orchestrating the murder of her brother-in-law. Most mafia bosses and brutal narcos we see in movies and series are men, but history has taught us women can be just as dangerous. However, very few people escape justice when all they've done is crimes. Here are some of history's most dangerous female mobsters, and here's how they got caught. Sandra Avila Beltran. Muchas gracias por todas las personas que me han, han tenido interés en mi, en mi página, este es el oficial. Today, Sandra Avila Beltran is trying to be a TikTok star, but the stories she tells are not for the faint-hearted. In fact, to many, it's deeply immoral that she is trying to gain fame by speaking of cartels and her brutal past with them. Sandra was born on October 11, 1960, into the Sinaloa cartel. Her mother's family were heroin smugglers. Her father, Alfonso Avila Quintero, was the brother of the Guadalajara cartel leader, Rafael Caro Quintero. Mexico has much corruption, but it's not just with the narcotraffic. There's much corruption cualquier ámbito social, comercio, empresas, tráfico de influencias con el narcotráfico, con indocumentados. In other words, Sandra was never really offered an alternative future. She was meant to be a part of the cartel world in Mexico. Sandra learned from her father that the best way to get rich is use this corruption to your benefit. As all narcos do, Sandra's family would bribe high-ranking officials and law enforcement officers to protect their business and stay out of prison. But while Sandra's family gave her piano and dance lessons and regular trips to Disneyland, they also put her in harm's way repeatedly. She was only 13 when she witnessed her first shootout, and for most of her life, she would also be the target of many nation attempts. Vamos a desayunar, Joel y yo. De, de un momento se atravesó un, car, un carro, nos cerró el paso y se bajaron dos personas armadas. Se nos pusieron de frente y empezaron a... Inició el tiroteo. El, la persona que me iba siguiendo armada trató de salir corriendo para que no lo tuvieran y lo detienen cuando él trata de salir. Es como yo me salvo y alcancé a ver a, a, a Joel tirado. Sandra lost her boyfriend this way. But in this brutal world, Sandra was already used to things like these happening to her loved ones. However, even as she grew up and began attending university to study journalism, her heart was still with the cartel world. Sandra only used her academic skills to become an expert money launderer for Mexican cartels. When she was 21, she started dating Amado Carrillo Fuentes, the boss of the Juarez cartel. Then, she became a prominent figure in the Sinaloa cartel, overseeing illegal substance shipments to the United States. Her relationship with Amado didn't last a long time, Time, but she would have many more, and her two marriages would be more tactical than romantic. Both her husbands were ex-police commanders turned traffickers. With their help, Sandra avoided justice for decades, while her husbands were both unalived. Sandra rose to the very top echelons of the cartel world, ending up head of public relations for the Sinaloa cartel, Mexico's most powerful cartel to this day. But even that wasn't enough for her. After Sandra started a relationship with Juan Diego Espinosa Ramirez, aka the Tiger, she began a lucrative business with his cartel, the Norte del Valle Cartel in Colombia. Through Sandra, Colombian and Mexican cartels were now united, and she was making more money for Sinaloa than ever before. According to The Guardian, Sandra had a habit of carrying suitcases with millions of dollars in $100 bills. By the end of the 20th century, Sandra had a fleet of private jets, several mansions, and constant invitations to VIP parties, many of which became crime scenes after her attendance. For Sandra, her climbing up the cartel ranks and enjoying a varied romantic life were manifestations of female empowerment in the misogynist cartel world. Women in this world, she explained, are abused, discarded, and tossed out with little more concern than a child abandoning a Barbie doll. Narco leaders would keep a harem of up to 10 women, and this sexual freedom, she emphasized, does not extend to their female counterparts. Women, she said, are looked at as objects, adornments, or a necessity, but never as a fighting being or a person made of triumphs and achievements. She wore a gold pendant with 228 diamonds on her neck, a big message to all the men who didn't take narco women seriously. But Sandra committed heinous crimes to get this rich. She even ordered the unaliving of people, 
so we can't really hail her as a feminist hero. Here's how she got caught. In 2002, Sandra's son was kidnapped, and she paid a $5 million ransom to get him back. This made authorities quite suspicious of her. Clearly, whoever kidnapped her son knew she was filthy rich. Then, there was another incident. In 2001, the United States seized a tuna fishing boat transporting nine tons of white snow. Sandra had been doing this for decades. Now, detectives put two and two together and realized she was the long sought after queen of the Pacific. Sandra lived on the run for five years before she was caught. Su nombre, por favor. Sandra Abigail. ¿De dónde es originaria? Tijuana, Baja California. ¿Cuál es su dirección? Mm, ¿Cómo? Santa Bárbara, 185. ¿Qué ciudad? León. ¿Qué estado? Guanajuato. Sandra never admitted her guilt. She maintained she worked in the clothing industry and claimed she didn't understand why she was being imprisoned. From prison, she bribed her way into a big cell. She was able to wear her jewelry and custom clothing and eat restaurant-made food. And yet, she denied working for the cartels. In 2012, she was extradited to the U.S. and named a key link in the white powder conspiracy. At last, Sandra Beltran pleaded guilty and got a 70-month sentence. Sandra ended up spending two years in solitary confinement for bad behavior. It was the first time she learned that money and influence couldn't always get her what she wanted. In 2015, she was released and is now living in Guadalajara. She lost most of her money and assets, including 15 homes, 30 sports cars, and 300 jewels. However, she's not done with being in the center of attention. Muchas gracias por todas las personas que me han, han tenido interés en mi, en mi página. Esta es la oficial. Las otras no son mías. Sandra shows just as little remorse for her actions as she did when she was arrested in 2007. It looks like prison taught her nothing, as today she's trying to become a TikTok star through her cartel stories. Maria Licciardi. Maria Licciardi led the notorious Secondigliano Alliance for half a century before she was finally arrested in 2021. Maria was known as La Picolina, or the Little One. Her petite frame stood in stark contrast to her personality. She was also called the Godmother and the Princess by other people in the Camorra Mafia. Maria was born on March 24, 1951, in the Neapolitan suburb of Secondigliano. Her entire family was part of the Camorra clan. In case you haven't heard of the Camorra, they control trafficking and extortion rackets in Naples. They're one of the bloodiest mafias in Italy. As one by one, Maria's male relatives were unalived or sent to prison, she began to take charge. She was the first female Camorista to become the boss of the Licciardi clan and take over as head of the Second Digliano Alliance. While other men fought for power, she seized it and even brought an unprecedented level of peace inside the Camorra. She brought together a fragile informal coalition of 20 Camorra clans in order to expand control of the city's most lucrative rackets, from drugs and cigarette smuggling to protect and she also played a key role in expanding the city's drug trade market. Under her leadership, the Second Digliano Alliance became more organized, secretive, sophisticated, and consequently more powerful. Maria wasn't a feminist hero either. In fact, she was the Camorra boss who introduced the illegal street worker trade into their CV. The Camorra ended up buying girls from the Albanian Mafia for $2,000. I can't begin to describe how disgusting and inhumane that trade is. Most of these girls are sought in vulnerable backgrounds and lied to about high-paying job opportunities in Italy. When they arrive, they are enslaved and subjected to things some would say are worse than death. So yeah, Maria Licciardi is not exactly a cool female boss. So it's safe to say that ever since she joined the Camorra ranks, law enforcement knew about her and they were trying to arrest her. Just like in the case of Mexican cartels, Italian mafias rely on corruption to have authorities in their pockets and continue their business on harm. But as always, there are incorruptible officers on the side of justice. Thankfully, for a long time, Maria dodged the law by shunning the limelight. She lived a secret, modest life and never spoke openly about what she did for a living. One Camorra insider described her as radiating a steely charisma. According to police sources, she was reputed to be practical, charming, exceptionally intelligent, but just as ruthless as her male counterparts. Maria had something in common with Pablo Escobar. She took time to give to the poor, thus establishing herself as a sort of local hero. And in an area where unemployment rates were huge, the Camorra provided a lot of people with a source of employment. This is the unexpected way people can end up admiring the Mafia. Apart from bribing authorities and politicians, Maria also had very good lawyers. In 1998, Maria and her sister Asunta were stopped in their car. They had around 300 million lire money law enforcement suspected was meant for a big bribe. Somehow Maria's lawyers got the two women out of that situation and she faded right into obscurity afterward. But all things must pass. After other smaller bosses in the Second Igliano Alliance sold a new type of deadly when that cost the lives of several Naples residents. There was a huge outrage against the Camorra. A big wave of arrests followed, and in 2001, Maria was arrested. In 2009, she was released. 
But in 2021, she was arrested again and sentenced to 13 years behind bars for leading the Camorra. She was previously among Italy's top 30 wanted fugitives. She was accused of running extortion rackets and is also accused of mafia-type association, extortion, and receiving stolen money. Her long list of crimes finally caught up to her. She was 70 years old when she was arrested, so it's likely she will spend the rest of her life in prison. Judith Marianne Moran. For this mobster, we travel all the way to Australia. Judy Moran is the notorious matriarch of the Moran criminal family in Melbourne, Australia. She is now in prison, but she was once behind the terrifying Melbourne gangland killings. Between January 1998 and August 2010, 36 people lost their lives in revenge acts involving underworld groups in Victoria. Most of the incidents remain unsolved. Judy Moran was born on December 18, 1944, making her 78 years old today. In 1963, she married her first husband, Leslie John Cole. In 1982, he was unalived in a gang conflict in Sydney. The marriage resulted in a son, Mark Cole, now Mark Moran. But here's where it gets murky. Judy's second husband was Louis Moran, also a big part of the Melbourne clan. And the two had another son, Jason. In the early 2000s, Judy lost both her sons. On June 15, 2000, Mark was gunned down outside his home. Three years later, also in June, Jason was unalived at a children's football clinic. And the following year, Louis was also unalived in a gang war. Then came Des Moran, Judy's brother-in-law. His life was taken in Ascot Vale in June 2009. But this was not a tragedy for Judy. In fact, she was arrested in connection with his unaliving. When detectives searched her home, they discovered a hidden safe containing three handguns, clothing matching the description of that worn by the culprit, a mask, and two stolen registration plates. Uh, handgun? It's a... Uh... Unlike in the previous cases, Judy was unable to bribe her way out of this. She was denied bail and later a jury found her guilty of Desmond Moran's unaliving. Gangland widow Judy Moran is tonight contemplating spending the rest of her life in prison after a jury found her guilty of orchestrating the murder of her brother-in-law. She was sentenced to 26 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 21 years. To the outrage of many people in Australia, Judy had announced that she was planning to write a book about her experiences just two weeks after her second husband's death. She said she wanted to clear her estranged partner's name. Several people worked to prevent this book from being published. They found it audacious, to say the least, that Judy was seeking money and fame with stories of crime. She had never stopped committing atrocities, and this was amidst the horrific Melbourne gangland killings. She was a wanted woman and a ruthless criminal, and yet she wanted to be famous for writing. Her book was eventually released in 2005 as My Story Through Random House. Less than a week later, Random House recalled the book from sale and pulped 20,000 copies after it was revealed that the book contained false allegations against a Victorian detective. Judy Moran will be spending the rest of her life in prison, and she will soon be forgotten. Rosetta Cudillo. We are going back to the Camorra for this one. Rosetta Cudillo was the sister of Camorra boss Raffaele Cudillo, head of the Nuova Camorra organization. Rosetta Cudillo was born on New Year's Day, 1937, in Ottaviano, Italy. She was the older sister of Raffaele Cudillo. Both were still young when they became involved with the Camorra Mafia. When he became boss, Raffaele had an idea. He would renew the Camorra into the new Camorra organization, or the NCO, but Raffaele didn't do a great job of hiding his crimes. In fact, he would often flaunt his riches and openly threatened people, convinced he had the power to do anything. Because of this, he spent most of his life in prison. Enter Rosetta. Raffaele was still able to conduct part of his illicit business from prison via phone and visitors, but someone had to keep it together outside too. So Raffaele had his older sister lead the NCO while he lived behind bars. She was the power behind her brother for over 15 years, passing on his orders from jail and cultivating his devoted followers outside. Without her, the NCO would have collapsed, according to a resident from Ottaviano. Rosetta kept a super low profile throughout her life on the opposite side of the spectrum from her brother. Reportedly, this is one of the reasons why they had a love-hate relationship fraught with rows. Rosetta ruled the NCO from the gorgeous Castello Mediceo, a huge 16th century palace with 365 rooms and a giant park with tennis courts and a swimming pool. The family had bought the entire castle for several billion lire. This just goes to show the size of the game they were playing. The NCO started out with contraband cigarettes and extortion schemes in the Neapolitan fruit market. But unlike like the original fragmented Camorra, which is a disorganized cluster of clans, the NCO was organized hierarchically like a Mexican cartel. By 1981, the NCO had become the most powerful Camorra clan, 
and one of the most powerful mafias in Italy. At least 200,000 people worked with or for the NCO. They had several conflicts with other Camorra clans and with the Sicilian Mafia. However, by forging alliances with the Indrangheta Mafia, the NCO stayed strong for a long while. Rosetta Cudolo was famously good with figures. She negotiated with South American white powder barons, narrowly failed to blow up law enforcement headquarters, and was glamorized in a film, Il Camorista. She participated in a high-level meeting with representatives of the Sicilian Mafia and Camorra clans to try to put an end to the wars and make more money together. It's interesting how even in Mafia contexts, women seem to gravitate toward peace and alliances over wars. However, Rosetta was leading a criminal organization, and authorities wanted her behind bars. In October 1981, officers raided her stronghold while she was presiding over a meeting of the NCO. Rosetta escaped under a rug in a car driven past checkpoints by the neighborhood priest. She was not seen in public thereafter for over 10 years, and directed operations from a series of safe houses in different cities. In February 1993, she gave herself up after law enforcement discovered her hideout. Rosetta appeared at the entrance and said, I am tired of being a fugitive. She had been sentenced in absentia in 1990 to nine years in prison on charges of mafia association, later reduced to five years. Prosecutors alleged she had been running her brother's organization. She was acquitted of nine murder charges. Rosetta had persuaded the authorities she was harmless, and her disheveled appearance certainly helped. Her brother, Raffaella, always maintained that Rosetta knew nothing of his criminal activities and did only what he asked. Rosetta has never been a camorista. She only listened to me and sent me a few suitcases of money to prisoners like I told her to. However, Raffaella was not just protecting his sister. He had always wanted to maintain a male-only organization based on principles such as criminal fraternity, and so could never be seen giving a role to his sister. Raffaella died in prison in 2021, age 79. Along with news of his death, his terrifying record was revealed. He commanded a legion of 10,000 men who smuggled pain and ran protection rackets, fathered a child by artificial insemination, and also inspired a 1986 movie starring Ben Gazzara, all while serving multiple life sentences. The peasant boy from Campania even sat at the table with top politicians as he was asked to negotiate the release of President of Campania, Ciro Cirillo, who was abducted by the Red Brigades, communist guerrillas, in 1981. Raffaele was known as the Professor and the Prince. There were countless outrageous stories about him, even though he spent most of his life in prison. The Don befriended younger prisoners providing them with protection, a sense of belonging and worth, which added to his ever-expanding network. Such was their loyalty that they sent money concealed in bouquets of flowers, and Cudolo would use the funds on the inside to gain more influence. For example, he bought food for poorer prisoners, and thereby created debts, which he would ask to be recompensed for, often with blood, when they were released. Cudolo established a unique ideology, which some have even described as a death cult, which argued that the value of life doesn't consist of its length, but in the use made of it. Sheesh. While Raffaele was a notorious figure who craved attention and drama, his sister kept a low profile and managed to spend a mere five years behind bars, all the while leading a top criminal organization for 15 years. It goes to show that flaunting blood money isn't the way to go. Rosetta died on October 14, 2023, at the age of 86. Maria Chata, Leon. At first glance, Maria Chata. Leon was a mother of 13 kids who lived a busy but peaceful life, but she was the head of a narcotics and human trafficking gang. She was so ruthless that she was feared by most of her male counterparts in Mexico and the US, and most of her children were involved in her criminal organization too. In 2008, her 22-year-old son, Daniel Leon, was unalived by the LAPD. Daniel had been involved in the drive-by gunfire of a member of a rival gang. As a sort of revenge against the LAPD, Maria had her son buried in the same cemetery as Michael Jackson and Walt Disney, and arranged for her to attend the funeral in front of several officers, even though she wasn't allowed to be on U.S. soil. Maria Leon sat like the queen spider in a web spun across the border from north to south, head of a massive criminal enterprise of drug dealing and murder, some of it backed by the militant revolutionary group known as the Mexican Mafia, according to investigators. For decades, the LAPD tried to destroy the power of the gangland matriarch and her extended family, but Maria was living in a sort of fortress, a huge fortified house in northeastern LA, in a neighborhood filled with violent gangs and gang-controlled homes. So whenever authorities would try to raid her home, they would be met with a map. When they were finally able to conduct a search raid on Maria's family home, they discovered a shrine to the patron saint of narco-trafficking, Jesus Malverde. They also found several surveillance cameras and a giant weapons stash, including a Tech-9 machine gun and several explosives. But one day, Maria fled the U.S. and went to Mexico temporarily, she thought. However, with a record involving smuggling, human trafficking, and homicide, she would never make it back in until her son's funeral. To attend her son's funeral, Maria had herself smuggled by one of her right-hand men, Eduardo Alvarez Marquez. Eduardo 
Eduardo had brought a three-month-old baby and a truck full of Chinese workers hidden in a freezer truck across the border. When Maria insisted she got over the border too, Eduardo suggested he helped her jump over the border fence. Her options were limited. The authorities would be looking for her. And indeed they would. While Eduardo was on the phone with Maria's son, Francisco Real, the feds were listening. They weren't even looking for Maria. They wanted intel on Francisco, who they believed was a top figure of the Drew Street gang, like several of his siblings. From listening in, the feds learned of Maria's crazy plan, so they had Eduardo arrested before anything else, on conspiracy to smuggle and transport illegal aliens. He would plead guilty. They also arrested up to 25 other illegal aliens, and finally, Maria Leon was caught too while attending her son's funeral. She thought she was getting her revenge on law enforcement, but it was actually the other way around. For her part, Maria Leon is serving an eight-year sentence in a federal prison, having been arrested in 2008 by immigration agents, on her way to visit a neighbor. Many others in the gang have pleaded guilty and are serving lesser sentences. Real, meanwhile, is cooperating with state and federal investigators and has publicly testified against some of his former gang and family members. On Drew Street, the war zone has died down and there's little evidence of the matriarch and her children who once ruled the area. Los Angeles authorities also tore down the family's compound. It's reassuring to see that even the most dangerous criminals out there eventually get a taste of their own bitter medicine. Hey, thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section and don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next time.